I'm Monique Kuglic, and I'm at the 2016 General Assembly of the European Geosciences Union in Vienna, Austria. And joining me is Professor Thomas Spengler. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to learn a little bit about your background, what got you interested in the atmospheric sciences, and what you're doing at this meeting. So you're originally from Munich, Germany, which is in the Alpine Foreland. And some of your research has looked at the behavior of atmospheric flow over mountainous topography. Did growing up near the Alps, an area with very unique uh, atmospheric uh, behaviors, motivate you to study the atmospheric sciences, or was it something else? No, that certainly uh, contributed to that. So uh, I was always keen hiking in the mountains, so they were very close. It's an hour out of Munich. And I actually developed, like, actually, when I started studying, I developed an interest in paragliding. So and this was really like, metrology life being in the atmosphere experiencing what you learn you know in the in the, in the lecture hall and uh, it really this was actually the the project you mentioned that was actually motivated through paragliding so there was a special wind phenomenon in the area where I learned to paraglide and no one understood it and everyone asked me because are oh, you studied metrology you should know it and I was like well I don't understand it and so I asked my professor and they, he didn't understand it so he said let's do an experiment so we went out there and we did a big experiment so like which I led in fact and that was like a huge inspiration and being able to do that and learn more and we understood the phenomena at the end so that was pretty inspiring yes so you're sort of like a daredevil meteorologist we could say <laughs> <laughs> um, additionally your research has explored extratropical cyclones polar lows and atmospheric ocean ice interactions and it often combines theory observational data and modeling how does each of these types of information contribute to a better understanding of atmospheric phenomena yeah, that's a very good question. So I'm I'm really leaning towards the theoretical side, I have to admit. So the, if, some, if, if it's something I cannot put in equations or in like physical context, then I, I, I can't understand it. So that, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Of course, you know, the pure theory is uh, often, uh, well, I wouldn't say illiquid, but it's very difficult to put everything in a theoretical context because the, the system is so complex. So this is where models are really handy. So you c in a model, you can you can put all the physics in there. You can you can manipulate the system to a certain extent so you understand the interactions. But then, of course, you can play with your theory and your model, but it needs a reality check. So this is why you have to go out there and actually validate if your hypotheses, if your ideas, if your theories and modeling experiments make any sense. And this is why I think everyone should actually combine these three elements in his or her research because that's the only way you can really uh, stick st stitch things together I think so this is why I, I really like doing that but it's it's challenging I see that too yes <laughs> it must give you a lot of data to work with so that could be <laughs> challenging to gather observational data your field work has brought you beyond the mountains you have spent time on research vessels in the arctic you spent time at the gulf of carpentaria in australia I'm not sure if i pronounced that right <laughs> can you tell us about the challenges of field works in these environments uh can you share any anecdotes yeah so <laughs> they couldn't be more different right <laughs> so one, one was uh, at uh, around 15 degrees south so in the tropics the gulf of carpentaria is in northern australia and the other one was in the research in the icebreaker actually a german icebreaker north of svalbard uh, so it was like at 82 degrees north in the in the ice so uh, both both locations were actually isolated in a way so we lived in a little village in in, uh, in northern queensland in australia for the experiment and you know it's a beautiful beach, but you're not allowed towards the beach because there's these crocodiles. So, so th th there's kind of the things you have to deal with. And then, of course, it was very isolated. And it was, I, I don't like the heat so much. That was a challenge for me. Um, on the icebreaker, it's a different challenge because, I mean, you, you're together with this when you can't escape. Like, I mean, like, if you're out in the wilderness, you can walk away from each other for a while and get, a, get some breath. On an icebreaker, you really have to very closely work together and you know there will be friction of course but you have to learn to deal with it and I, th I really appreciate that and it comes down to really very good leadership in some people that actually lead these groups and to me on the ship it was very inspiring also because unlike this field campaign where it was just like us atmospheric scientists like 15 of us um, on a research vessel especially a big one like Paul Ash and I was on there's 50 researchers which means it's it, it's different disciplines so because they're, they're trying to 
put them together in a way that they have the most efficient usage of the of the vehicle. So that way you learn something about biology, about geology. I was actually with a geoseismic group, so so I learned a lot of different things, and then you learn how to connect and how it all goes together, and that was very inspiring in a way. And I love the Arctic, I have to say, that was nice. Yeah. Huh. Following your education at the University of Munich in Germany, Monash University in Australia, and the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland, you spent time working at NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory at Princeton University. Since 2010, you've been a faculty member at the University of Bergen in Norway. How did your education and prior work experience prepare you for your professorship? For younger scientists who could be seeking a similar academic career, can you give any advice? Yeah, that's, again, a very good question. There's a lot of things that do not really prepare you for professoriate, I would say, in academic career. So, I mean, no one really prepares you for teaching. You have to kind of, I mean, I, I, I love teaching as a PhD since I was a, a teaching assistant and I, I really enjoyed that very much. And I, I took courses on teaching, but that was like my own interest. Um, so I really encourage early career scientists who want to make a career in academia that, you know, teaching will be part of your career so take some courses I mean otherwise it will be a very cold shower once you hop in there um, the other thing is also you will be getting involved in all sorts of committees and politics so it's, it's very good to talk to your peers you know what does this involve you know what, what what how do you run these meetings or you know how do you maneuver in there etc so so I learned a lot by communicating with my supervisors before I took on the professorship. And something I really much appreciate when I, so we mentioned GFDL, so I was at Princeton University there. And, um, and they offered a fantastic um, program for graduate students. And so as a postdoc, I, I was able to participate in that. And there were like courses on how to teach, how to design a course. Uh, and a course I very thoroughly enjoyed. It was called Prof 101. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like how to, how, how to become a professor 101. So, and it was very inspiring. So it was different professors giving like presentations about, you know, this is, this is what I struggled with at the beginning and this is what you might want to focus on. This is why I got help here and so forth. And I think these kind of courses, I only know it from Princeton. I'm, I haven't seen another university offering a similar course, but I think this is actually great. This would be a call out to universities actually <laughs> to, to create these courses to help young early career scientists to actually ease more into to, to academic careers, yeah, yeah. I also never heard of that type of course. That's really interesting that they offer that. In addition to giving lectures and supervising graduate students, you're the director of the Norwegian Research School on Changing Climates in the Coupled Earth System and the chair of the Atmospheric Working Group of the International Arctic Science Committee. I've also come across a lot of your articles in our journals. As a technical editor, I'm always excited to get one of your papers. And so I know that you're really a highly productive researcher. How do you juggle all these responsibilities? Well, the, the usual thing to say is hard work, right? <laughs> but uh, <coughs> it, it is hard work, of course. But I mean, I love what I do. So uh, that helps, of course, a lot. And uh, for me, I mean, you, you see some of the papers, all right? So uh, they are co-authored with, with very different people. So and a lot of, you mentioned like where, where I did all my education. So I still work with these people and I find that very inspiring. And that, that's something that also keeps, keeps me mentally sane and kind of uh, inspires me. Um, so but it, is, it is a lot of work to do, like, I mean, like being the president now of this uh, research school because you want to run it well. So there's a lot of different responsibilities. And it's a, as you say, you have to juggle, you have to reprioritize. Um, and you have to kind of make sure that the reprioritization, of course, still keeps you motivated to do what you do. But I actually, I, I gain a lot from these things. Like interacting with uh, graduate students in, in this research school is fantastic. It's very inspiring. And you see all the eagerness and everything. So that's fantastic. And the, the, uh, the working group you mentioned, the International Arctic Science Committee, that's also very inspiring because there's like a, this, we're, we're like 25 researchers in atmosphere science and we're kind of trying to, sh to prioritize the, the research agenda for the Arctic uh, sciences. And uh, I find it very rewarding, actually. So I encourage people to participate, but it has to go along with what you like to do and what, what, you really, what motivates you. So yeah, okay. yes. Yeah. Last but not least, I saw in the EGU program that Anik Terpstra is gonna be giving a talk presenting the results of your polar low study that's about to be published in Monthly Weather Review. So look out for that paper. Will you also be giving a talk at this meeting, or do you have other objectives for attending EGU? Yes, so um, 
I have a talk, an invited talk also myself. Uh, it is not an AMS journal paper, I have to <coughs> shamefully admit it was, uh, it was some published somewhere else. But so yeah, I'll give a talk tomorrow. Um, but I'm also here, like as you mentioned, so the, 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 the project Anik Tapstra, my postdoc, uh, is involved in. So th this coming to an end, so we have actually uh, four, four uh, contributions to the EGU that are coming out of this project, which I'm very proud of. So, so I'm here for those. There's some posters today and uh, there's a talk on Friday as well. So yes. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was really a pleasure getting to know you a bit better. Thanks.